Well, welcome back. And uh, now uh, this is uh, one more session that's going to blow your mind a little bit. And uh, Dr. Lundgren uh, has a, a, just an amazing, compelling story and is going to give you some insights into what goes on in science and some of the science he's pursued. So I'm, I'm going to leave it at that and uh, look forward to have your, uh, your proverbially, uh, proverbial socks blown off. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Thanks. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, here we are again. You guys burning out yet? Saturated? All right. Well, we'll see if we can keep everybody awake. If I start dozing off, kind of shake me a little bit. Um, so for those of you who didn't catch it yesterday, uh, I'm John Lundgren. Uh, I run Ecdysis Foundation, a 501c3. We're doing the science to try to help uh, push um, regenerative agriculture forward. And then I'm also a farmer, beekeeper, uh, and operate Blue Dasher Farm. Um, we're going to be talking about science and risk and the future of agriculture, all kinds of good stuff. So we're going to be covering a lot of ground. Um, for those of you, uh, well, I'll show you more later, but uh, we're, I'm from South Dakota. And so that helps put some things in perspective, all right? <laughs> Um, but without further ado, uh, I recently was at a meeting and afterwards I, um, the president of a university, uh, was, it, it got a hold of me and, uh, he's like, oh, you were, you were pretty hard on science. And I said, yeah, yeah, I was. And, 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 uh, he's like, you know, that's a real disservice because there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people that are, I mean, we believe in, in conservation agriculture too. And, and, uh, and I thought to myself, uh, where's the relative investment, though? I mean, honestly, at the federal level, at the university level, where are they putting their money? Is it behind the current model of agriculture? Or are they truly investing in innovating our food production system? Or is it just keeping the status quo good enough, getting that extra two, three bushels a year? right? Just squeezing it out just a little bit more. I'm doing my job, right? And, uh, and I thought to myself, you know what? This is Iowa, right? And, uh, right, so yeah, you see, <laughs> what was Iowa at one point? This is all cultivation now. Brown is cultivated areas, which is primarily, you know, corn and soybeans. I think 95, maybe 99% of Iowa has been tilled. It used to be, uh, it used to be um, a prairie at one point. Illinois is very similar, right? Illinois is very similar. And, and I thought to myself, you know what? What the hell have we done, right? What have we done? Shame on us. Shame. Okay, because what this, who can drive through here and say that what we did in Iowa is morally and ethically okay? How is that okay? When we replaced how many hundreds of plant species with two? Dozens of mammals that used to be wandering the prairie, keeping that system going, we've got one, maybe two. Most of the, their lives are spent in a big confinement. And I thought to myself, you know what, university professor? When the universities can drive through, because this was done on their watch, right? This was, their, this was partially their responsibility. They made this. When a university president or a university in general can drive through Iowa and say, you know what, this is wrong. What we've done here is wrong, and we are going to devote what we have left of our resources to truly innovating our food production system. That is when the land grant mission of the universities will be realized again. Okay? That's when we will be, they will be doing their jobs once again. Because Lincoln had a brilliant idea back in the 1860s. You know what he said? He said, you know what? If we don't protect science, 
and start giving the universities money. Every state should have an agricultural university that we just give them money. And they should do high risk research that pushes us forward rather than just doing research that maintains the status quo, that keeps the coffers of the large corporations happy. What a brilliant idea and what a complete loss of mission sense have we experienced in the university systems and in the federal system as well. Wow. So, that pisses people off sometimes. <laughs> and I'm not saying corn and beans are bad. I'm not saying that corn and beans are the enemy, right? It's how we're producing them. It's how brittle we've become. Boy, we're on the edge of a cliff here, folks. We're on the edge of a cliff, and we're looking over. Farmers are way overextended right now. They're not, making their, <laughs> they're not making money back to pay off the land prices as they are, as they are right now. Look at, if, I just read uh, The Worst Hard Times. It's about the Dust Bowl era that preceded the Great Depression. You replace the word wheat in that book with corn, and we are on the edge of a Great Depression right now because everything that happened back in the 30s, we're going through right now. It's like, what the heck? How does this happen? Well, ultimately, farmers are the ones who make the just choices on their own farms, right? But those farmers are being led. Um, they're being led by various information sources, the land-grant universities. Agro-industry is a huge player here and controls. They're the puppet masters. They're the puppet master. Government agencies have all contributed in various ways, shapes, and forms to producing Iowa or the Central Valley of California would be another great example, right? Okay, you've seen a lot of good examples of regenerative farms and they seem to be working. So why isn't it that everybody is, farm, is not farming regeneratively right now, right? I'll even produce, uh, pr provide you some data that says that it's way more profitable to be farming regeneratively in a little bit. Why isn't everybody doing this? Well, what we're talking about is a paradigm shift. Paradigm shifts, number one, don't come from the government. Paradigm shifts, governments follow, they don't lead, they follow. Paradigm shifts come from the ground up. And it's happening right now, it's happening. You get, this meeting is a great example of that paradigm shift starting to take hold. I mean, would there have been a meeting like this in Monterey five years ago even? Come on, things are starting to happen, right? And I would argue, and maybe this, is, maybe this is my own bias here that we're talking about, but I think that science has been used to stifle the innovation of our food system, okay? Not help it, but stifle it. I was recently watching Cosmos with uh, the one with Neil deGrasse Tyson, the more recent one with my kids. And it's like, uh, have you guys seen this before? It's like every episode, it kind of goes through the history of science. And, and, um, and every episode is like, oh, you know, so-and-so, he discovered that, you know, light refracts in a certain way. And, and, and so it really, you know, it helped us change how we, you know, look at telescopes and, and really our perception of the universe. And so they, they cut off his hands and burned the guy at the stake. And you're like, every episode. And my kids are like, what the hell is going on here, right? Science produces, <laughs> it's not always easy being a scientist, right? Especially when you're starting to question what's going on. Um, these two guys uh, really helped us to understand better our place in the universe, and, and they suffered severe consequences for that, renouncing their, um, their, uh, their beliefs and whatnot, and uh, having threats put against them. Uh, Alfred Wegener, uh, he was crazy enough to think that, you know, the plane, <laughs> get a little of this. These continents are riding on these plates on the ocean and they're moving around. How ridiculous is that, right? And it's not until years and years later that we realized just how right he was. Barbara McClintock was crazy enough to be a woman in science, which, you know, I mean, 
who would have thunk that could happen? Um, but then also was brilliant in, in discovering that genes within an organism don't stay put on that chromosome. They're hopping around, right? And this became, in so many ways, the basis of our understanding of modern genetics. And she was absolutely ostracized. Nobody talks to Barbara McClintock, right? People steal her ideas left and right, but finally she's vindicated. Alan Turing discovered computers, so they cut his balls off. Lynn Margulis um, discovered a whole new branch of evolution, where, um, uh, where evolution doesn't just occur through natural selection through time, but rather they, they uh, 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 symbiosis, where organisms work together and form new organisms, that no one organism, no one critter is, a, is an organism, it's a community, right? It's a whole community of different things living in harmony with each other, and that drives evolutionary processes. Crazy, huh? Now we teach this in our textbooks as, as the organelles in cells are actually former, um, uh, former bacteria. So crazy, crazy. And this is a very, very short list, folks. So it's humbling for me to say, um, but science is not perfect. I mean, I got into science thinking, trying to understand the world, right? I was seeking truth. And I thought that science could do that, that science could somehow give me a firmer understanding of the universe and where I fit in that universe. Science doesn't do that. Science doesn't provide proof. That's math. Math provides proof. Science provides a framework, though, and it's really useful for trying, if you use it correctly, for trying to understand things that are happening within your, within your, within your own realm. So, science, there is never, there's never once been a perfect study. There's not one that exists. Science is not, it, it, it's gray. Science is not black and white. It helps us to advance our understanding, but it is not perfect, okay? And science is manipulated. For those of you, uh, there's a really good Netflix uh, documentary called Merchants of Doubt. And then there's a really great book by Naomi Moreskis that the documentary was based upon. But it talks about how um, science is manipulated. And it's become a formalized process. How on earth did they convince us for decades that cigarettes had no consequences on human health? Right? How did they do that? Well, the tobacco industry formalized how to, how to <laughs> manipulate science. It was brilliant. And now this has been used in so many different ways, from climate change and making sure that we don't understand what, it's just gray, you know, all of this stuff about climate shifting. It's crazy stuff. Um, uh, things like pesticide exposures, things like genetically modified crops and how they affect things, right? Okay, so how does this work in a nutshell? Okay, so, uh, so you get a study that does not support your agenda. What's the first step in this process? Well, science is not black and white. Science is gray. So all you have to do is point out all of the problems with that scientific study, okay? And it's not hard. And suddenly that piece of science, which is actually probably conducted pretty well, looks like crap, right? It just looks like, oh, well, that's just a turd. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. All right, so if science is gray and it's not black and white, how do we make decisions based on science? Well, you repeat si studies, right? Under different circumstances, you repeat these different studies over and over again, trying to get at the same question. And eventually you hope that there's a consilience of evidence, that things start to align, right? Okay, so if we rely on this preponderance of evidence, where does that come from? Money. Science isn't cheap. So suddenly, what you do is, first off, you, you, if, there's, if there's a problematic study, you make sure that that looks like crap. And then you fund, because science is for sale to the highest bidder. I hate to say it, but it's absolutely true. Science is for sale, so you just start buying science. 
okay? And then suddenly you can fund a preponderance of evidence, and so you're starting to weigh the deck, or you're starting to stack the deck in your favor, all right? But finally, you've got <sighs> one of these idealist scientists who doesn't back down. They still think that their study was valuable, and they're getting press. This isn't good. So you know what you do? You destroy that person. You eviscerate them publicly. You, you don't even attack the science. You attack their personal life. You hurt everybody. You destroy everybody that that person cares about, right? And then you put their corpse up on a stake. And nobody ever pursues that question again. There is no incentive for a scientist to pursue a controversial issue. I get paid the same, well, not anymore. I used to get paid the same whether or not I counted lady beetle spots or I investigated the risk of neonicotinoids, right? Or RNAi. So, that <laughs> is how science happens in the modern age, folks. It's a dirty, dirty process. They don't teach you that in graduate school. Case in point, I was recently up in Canada talking with uh, um, some, some scientists as well as some farmers up there, and the first thing I got up there and said is, neonicotinoids on canola is killing honeybees. Boy, that pissed a lot of people off. Canola Council was well represented, and some scientists came up to me afterwards and they said, no, John, no. The science on neonics and bees is not conclusive. It's gray. It's not black and white. And I said, where'd you, where, <laughs> who support, do you get any canola money? Yep, they sure do. Do you think that influences what they decide? Yeah, sure does. Neonicotinoids. Uh, in case you don't know, this is a neurotoxin. It's on 13% of the terrestrial land surface of the continental United States. It's planted at this point. Um, one corn seed has enough neonicotinoid uh, to kill, I think I, I've had to revise my number, it's about 160,000 bees. One corn seed. <coughs> That's getting into the environment. It's getting into the water. It's getting into other plants, and it's getting into the soil. These neonicotinoids are 7,000 times more toxic to honeybees than DDT was. 7,000 times. And we're planting it on 13% of, uh, of our country. Come on. It impacts almost every life history trait of the honeybee. Almost every single life history trait. I mean, uh, uh, from their behavior to, to yeah. The data is staggering, and it's really irresponsible not to recognize that. Finally, science is necessary, but it is not sufficient, okay? It is not sufficient. And so we train our scientists to communicate science to other scientists. And it's a self-perpetuating problem. Um, we need to be teaching the next generation of scientists, especially within applied fields, to start communicating science to other people that need the information, right? Okay. So science on its own does not affect behavior. If we were strictly a data-driven society, boy, we'd be <laughs> I wish we were. I wish I was. I'm not. Um, uh, we can know what the best data is, and then we do something entirely different. Okay. And so it takes more than that. It takes communication. It takes relationships in order to change behavior. And that's what we're trying to do within regenerative agriculture right now is change behavior. All right. Data is important. All right. Um, risk. Risk assessment. I've been working on risk assessment of pesticides and genetically modified crops for about 20 years now. Um, working on uh, advising the Environmental Protection Agency, the European Food Safety Authority, the Brazilians, uh, uh, many different places. Um, this has been uh, one of my areas of, of specialization. 
And I can tell you after working on this for about 20 years that when you go to the grocery store or you go to the, to the co-op co or whatever, wherever you're buying this stuff and you read on the side of the jug that it's safe, there's an assumption. There's an assumption that somebody's watching. And I could tell you after 20 years, nobody is watching. Nobody is watching. How? How could they? How could they be? Right now in the U.S., we evaluate the active ingredients. So, like for Roundup, the active ingredient is glyphosate. Um, for neonicotinoid seed treatments or gaucho or whatever, the 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 uh, the active ingredient is thiamethoxam, for example. So we evaluate those those active ingredients. But as soon as you put all of the, that in active ingredient into a formulation, it entirely changes the, the risk profile of that active ingredient. And so what we really need to be doing is at risk assessments on formulations of pesticides. There are 20,000 formulations of pesticides in the US. How on earth are you supposed to do risk assessments on 20,000 chemistries? It's not possible, right? So right now we assess the risk of these, you know, these this the couple hundred different active ingredients against a suite of 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 indicator species. We put a parasitoid wasp in there, we put the honeybee in there in a petri dish and then we say how much of this stuff kills it. We've got hundreds of species of just insects within within a standard cornfield in eastern South Dakota. Many of them, we don't even know what their ecological function is. How do you assess the risk of 20,000 chemicals against hundreds of species in every habitat? The idea, it's laughable, okay? And I'm not saying that we should be banning all pesticides, okay? I'm not saying that we should be banning genetically modified crops. What I'm saying is that we need to be using a hell of a lot more respect than we are right now for these things because we cannot see the end of this story. DDT, you guys know DDT. You've all heard of DDT. I mean, the best technology of the day said DDT was safe. And it wasn't for decades before we understood the full ramifications of that chemical. The best technology of the day right now is saying that these pesticides are safe. Are we going to look back on this time and say, what were we thinking? Here's a good example. Is glyphosate harmless to bees? So glyphosate is um, Roundup. Right? And when glyphosate was registered with the EPA, they had to do tox assays on glyphosate and they determined that there was no toxicity of glyphosate. Okay? And so we did, uh, Juliette Penot was a student in our lab um, and she did a toxicity assay of Roundup because really bees are never exposed to glyphosate. They're exposed to the formulated chemical, right? They're exposed to Roundup in the field. And so we did, an ex we did a toxicity assay in the laboratory to see whether or not Roundup is toxic to bees, okay? Um, we did a dose response. So we put a certain amount of toxin within that, um, within that, uh, that, 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 that cup with the bees, in these little cups with bees, and then we fed it to them, and then we looked at how much of it killed the, or, uh, the honeybees, right, in a nutshell. Entomologists in our spare time, we like to put bees in these little things, and we make little game chess men with them, and then we play, no, well, we might. Uh, this is actually what we do is we take these uh, bees and then one way that we determine bees learning is we let them taste a substance, you know, a toxin, and then uh, with their feet because they've got taste receptors on their feet. And then, uh, and then the time that it takes them to uh, kind of bleh, avert their tongue, the proboscis extension response is how we measure uh, learning within bees. And so we were, int we're interested in all sorts of different components of their life history. 
Um, this is the duration of live uh, roundup at, at label rates. Killed 99% of the bees. Whoops. After a 10-day exposure. So we exposed them for, uh, well, actually, we exposed them for three days and then uh, measured mortality at the end of that 10 days. Most of the mortality happens right away. Uh, this is the dose of, uh, of, of, um, of Roundup, and then this is the duration that they were alive. So this is the field-related dose right here, the, the label rates right here. Um, so we, as part of this, we needed a positive control, which is, um, so we needed to make sure that the bees were actually eating the substance and then dying rather than starving themselves to death. And so we feed them a very toxic substance. In this case, potassium arsenate, which is arsenic. Okay. Um, and that's the label rate, and that's potassium arsenate. Roundup at the label rate was almost as toxic as our... Wow. Huh? Um, another little game that entomologists like to play is we feed them some toxin and then we uh, put some glass over them and then we release a bee in here and we chase it with a marker over a certain amount of time and then we measure the distance that it's walked over a certain amount of time to get walking speed. So a, a way to kind of measure how lethargic they become. And what we find is that Roundup also affected these bees sublethally as well. We're getting more of the learning responses and things like that. Um, uh, all of this data is so fresh, it's steaming. So, then we went out into the into bee bee uh, yards around uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota. This is where most of the nation's beehives over summer, and we tested the honey for the presence of uh, glyphosate. We don't have an ELISA for Roundup specifically, but really Roundup is the only way that they would be getting the glyphosate. Um, 87% of the honey samples came back positive, and we'll have, um, we'll have the quantity of that after uh, we're all finished with that data. Almost all of the bees are being exposed to this stuff. Okay. So I presented that information on a radio program down in New Zealand when I was down there, and uh, she's, the lady's like, well, if we don't have Roundup, what are we supposed to, then well, there's going to be more tillage, and isn't tillage really damaging too? And I'm like, boy, you know, if the, honestly, if I had to choose between Roundup and tillage, I would probably pick Roundup. I mean, tillage is a really damaging thing. Kills the biology, sets you back so far, so far. In terms of life in your soil. Luckily, those are not your only two options, right? I mean, come on, folks. Come on. We've got livestock. I want to make, uh, that's what we do on our farm. I want to make money off of my weeds, right? Why would I spend money to control that forage, right? Um, crop rotations, cover crops. There's a lot of other options, okay? There's a lot of other options. There I am, I'm a good looking fella, look at that. Bright eyed, bushy tailed. Um, earlier in my career, I was uh, named one of the top scientists in the country. Um, I received an award in the White House from President Obama. I was doing everything right. Had students and postdocs galore. I was, I was playing the game, right? Publications, over a hundred publications. I wrote a book by the age of 30. Uh, millions in grants, you know, advising the advise or the, like federal agencies by the, my mid 30s, uh, and and yeah, everything was going right, and then I met these jerks, <laughs> and what these farmers were saying is that you know what, everything that you're talking about right now is wrong that y everything that you learned in graduate school in terms of how to manage pests, you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to go out there and you're supposed to watch for insects that you don't like, and then you kind of wait and you count them, and then, uh, oh, oh, they're almost there, they're almost to the threshold. And then you react, right? You react! You kill them. What these guys said is, you know what, if you design your system right, you don't have pests. 
We don't even think about pests anymore. What a concept, right? And the science was absolutely in these guys, it, it, not in these guys' favor and gals' favor, okay? The science said what they were doing couldn't be done. And so we did some science in order to try to see whether or not what these guys were anecdotally telling us from all over the world, but especially all over the U.S., whether or not what they were saying was true. So this is Claire. Um, she just got her master's degree. Um, and what she did was kind of the culmination of about 15 years, eh, 10 years worth of research in our, in our research lab. Okay. What she did is she kind of gave the coup de grace. Um, she went out to corn farms around the region. So North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, and Nebraska. This is corn country, right on the western edge of corn country. And she wanted to compare regenerative corn production with conventional corn production. So we went to the leaders who were practicing best management practices on their farms, the ones who had developed systems that, and they were working. They had been tested and they were working. Okay? And then we went out there and we sampled those and then we said, point us to Point us to the, the farms that are, your, that are in your neighborhood that are doing things right, but conventionally, right? And so we went out and we sampled those guys and gals too. So this is systems focus. It's best management practices. This is not on a research farm where a scientist kind of goes out there and is like, all right, so we're going we're gonna to plant you know, uh, three rows, and they're going to be 10 feet each, and then we're going we're gonna to partition out every little aspect of this thing because we know best right? We're the scientists. What these were saying is that the farmers have already done that, right? They've already developed these systems and tested them out. And so what we wanted to study was best management. We didn't want to study what we thought was the best. Regional focus and systems level. So the practices that generated these systems varied, okay? Because every operation is a little bit different. But there were certain themes that were similar. Number one is that the guys and gals that were, uh, that were called regenerative had no insecticides used, okay? And that all of the conventional farms all used insecticides as neonicotinoid seed treatments as well as uh, genetically modified crops, BT corn. Okay. Then we went out and we, we cut down plants and we, we sucked all of the insects off of the plant. So, uh, so it was in whole plant dissections, pests, everything, okay? And then we got down on our hands and knees, and Tommy's got some stories of doing this in chicken shit. It's wonderful. <laughs> in all the orchards. It's a lot of work on your best day, but really, when you're in chicken crap, that's no good at all. Uh, and then sucked up all of the insects from the soil surface, and then we took these cores, right? We drilled down into the soil and we brought them back and we extracted all of the insects that were living within the soil column itself. And then we also looked at the yields and the profits of each of these cornfields from around this region. And this is what we found. The insecticide treated cornfields had 10 times more pests than the ones that never saw insecticide. Oops. That wasn't supposed to happen, was it? You think we've been sold? You think we've been sold a, a load of crap? I do. I think that this turns traditional entomology and integrated pest management on its head. What we're teaching our entomologists these days. I think that this, uh, because what these guys did, they didn't, they didn't just stop using insecticides, right? They replaced insecticides with good management. They replaced insecticides with diversity. You saw the graphs yesterday, right? Where as, as you increase diversity in your cornfields, you see that pests disappear. All right. That's the culmination of that. They don't have pests. Yields were reduced significantly in the regenerative operations, but they were twice as profitable. Why the hell do we give prizes to the corn farmer who can grow 300 bushel corn? 
of the highest yielding corn in a, in a state. A well-trained monkey can grow 300 bushel corn if he puts enough junk out there, right? That's not profit. We're farming for profits here. So they were twice as profitable. You want to know why? They paid about half the amount for their seed. They paid significantly less for fertilizers. And they marketed their product. They didn't just drive a truck down to the coop, right? They were trying to find markets to add value to their crop. We wanted to know, okay, so if, if yields were not correlated, this does not stand, right? The yields, what's correlated with profit if yields don't seem to be? And so we looked, each dot is a cornfield. This is the profit per cornfield. This is soil organic matter. As the soil organic matter, in the, or the, uh, as the organic matter in the soil, especially the particulate organic matter in the soil, increases on these corn farms, the profit does too. Um, this study is currently uh, published in uh, one day. It's published open access in Peer J. In one day, Claire, my master's student, her study um, became. Um, it rose to the 99th percentile of all science ever written in terms of its social media impact. That's saying a lot. That's saying a lot. Do you think the world is ready for this? Do you think we're hungry for something different? I do. And then I met these folks. That got me in more trouble beekeepers um, so what these guys were saying is that the pesticides were killing their bees but the data just wasn't clear the science says no and we used our science to start to validate that what these guys were observing in their hives is actually happening the pesticides were indeed killing their bees and everything started to change I went from being the golden boy to being something much different um, the first uh, thing that I did wrong was that we did a study that proved that neonicotinoids uh, did not help farmers in our region. They didn't improve yields of soybeans, corn, um, sunflowers, and that they kill the monarch butterfly, um, which is at currently at 10% of its historic population. So they're thinking about red listing it on the endangered species list. Um, and so, yeah, so. <sighs> They never attacked me based on, on the, sci <laughs> the science itself. Sometimes they did, but not early on. They, they attacked me on procedural problems. Okay? And so you have to, when you're a USDA employee, you have to get like approvals up and down the list. And, and so if you didn't have all your paperwork in, in place, then suddenly you, know, you become you know, a criminal. And so, I, uh, and so I had all of my paperwork was done on this paper. I had it peer reviewed and then I submitted it to the peer reviewed literature and it was accepted. Everything was fine. Everybody up the chain knew that this was going out there. And then it, got, uh, it went uh, on to public radio and uh, got a lot of attention. And suddenly they said, you know what? You didn't have approval. I'm like, what? I did two. Here's all the paperwork. No. And you're suspended for two weeks. You didn't have approval and you're suspended. No pay. Like, what is happening? What's going on? And then we did this. Monsanto's new, newest technology um, is RNAi based in uh, pesticides. These are genetic pesticides. Um, and what he said is that uh, this, what we said was that this posed um, unique risk from all other pesticides in terms of its. Um, uh, its risk to non-target species, right? This is my job that I'm supposed to be doing, right? I'm supposed to be protecting farmers around the country. Um, and, and they said, no, you cannot publish this. So I quit eventually, and I published it anyways. Um, so, uh, yeah, they actually started to suppress science. That's not okay, right? This should be allowed to be published so that we can have scientific dialogue in the public domain, right? That's the way science is supposed to happen. 
And then the third thing that I did was that me and an economist friend who actually happens to live here in Monterey, so I'll be going out to supper with him tonight. Um, he's an uh, yeah, he's an economist. Um, we we said we looked at this crop profile and we said you know our food production system is really brittle right now and and this is a actually kind of a threat to national security if we continue to go down this road by over investing in a few commodities we are really at risk okay and we discussed how this happened and how this evolved and so we got it accepted to the peer-reviewed literature and then they said nope John you have to actually retract your name from that paper you cannot publish that we won't allow it. What on earth? That is never okay. Um, and this precipitated a series of events within USDA. This isn't unique to USDA. This happens at the universities all the time. This happens uh, at, at without, throughout USDA all the time. Um, daily harassment. Every day I was expecting a call from Fort Collins, Colorado to get bitched out about something. They would find things. I'd have to, for talking at like a field day, you know, where there's gonna be like 30 farmers from the county are gonna be there. Oh, you need to have seven approvals on your slides for this, you know, thing. And we're we, all the way up to Washington, D.C. A lot of times it was the Secretary of Agriculture's office that ended up having to make approvals on whether or not John Lundgren got to talk about RNAi. Crazy. Um, they hauled every one of my supervisees into a room with a light, like blaring in their face, just like you see in like you know James Bond movies, uh, on camera and interrogated them, searching them for anything that my, I might have stepped out of line. Every one of them, looking for anything I might have done wrong. I was no longer allowed to speak to the media. Um, suspensions uh, without pay, um, and but they, they and then they started to suppress the science, and that, <sighs> yeah, this was yeah, this was on the front page of the Washington Post, Sunday Magazine. Um, that is when uh, I decided, you know what, I'm try I tried to change the system from within. And there's got to be a different solution. There's got to be. And so I quit. And I quit noisy. Um, I, uh, yeah, I blew the whistle on scientific suppression within the USDA. It prompted a, it prompted a, a survey uh, of USDA scientists that revealed that 200 other scientists had experienced similar scientific suppression. And they didn't say anything about it. They didn't do anything. Wow. I mean, the reason that I was put into that position is because 200 other scientists experienced this exact same thing I did, and I didn't do anything about it. And I guess I get it. I mean, <coughs> fear makes good people do bad things. And all the way up my chain of command, these decisions were making, being made to suppress science in a scientific agency. And they were justifying it in their heads. It's like, wh what happens to people? And I, like I said, I get it. You know, I mean, I'm sitting here, I've got 13 people in my research team and they're all depending on me for a salary. And I've got a family at home, and they're depending on me to make the right choice and make sure that I'm bringing home the bacon. And suddenly, you know what? It's just, it's just a neonic, right? It's just a neonic, and if I just don't do that study, or I just shut up, then, then it's all, all of those people that I care about are taken care of. Right, um, but what I decided is that uh, that's how this system is perpetuating itself. Is that people are just laying down, and so uh, 
So I uh, threw the bubonic plague infested cow over the ramparts and uh, and we we tried to make some changes. Um, yep, that's way too many slides, and that's, you've already seen all of that. I don't know what's going on here. And so that's when, when I quit and I started this place. Because we need to be having science. Science needs to be used to re restart, or renovate, or, 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 or reinvigorate our food production system. And it isn't going to come from the current infrastructure. We are filling the niche that the land grants used to fill by doing no strings attached research. Uh, our first center was based here in South Dakota. We're opening up another one this year over in Minnesota. Um, I was down um, talking with some folks about maybe opening up one here in California. Our goals are to, if you grow corn, soybeans, and cows, you know where to go for your information, all right? But if you are trying to graze underneath your almond trees, if you are trying to establish multi-species cover blends in a no-till system, or intercropping four different species of crops in the same place at the same time, you don't have any place to go. That's our niche. Okay, that's what that's the role that we're trying to we're trying to keep the innovators pushing it. We're trying to remove hurdles as quick as we can as these guys are like rushing towards the goalpost, right? Um, education is really important here. We're trying to train the next generation of scientists as well as farmers, beekeepers, and these principles. But I think what makes us really unique, you know how many scientists kind of get up there and they talk about, here, give advice, right? Oh, do this, that, and the other thing. As, as you can see from this p-value, this is the right thing to do. Um, but they've never walked a mile in, in, in your shoes. And, and so to increase our credibility and increase the relevance of our science, we decided to um, become farmers and beekeepers ourselves. And I can tell you that I've advised farmers and I've advised beekeepers, but I was never a farmer and I was never a beekeeper. It's different, okay? And, uh, and it's really influenced the type of science that we do now. Um, we have a resilient business model. Donations are really important for keeping our doors open. We are trying to do no strings attached research. We are more competitive for research grants, competitive research grants than we were as a USDA employee. Uh, we're trying to generate farm revenue enough to cover the, um, the, the site leaders um, uh, or center directors um, salary and then education funds from events like this. Um, we would not be here without just a tremendous group of, of, of supporters. Um, people have sprung up from all over the world to come to Dual County, South Dakota, um, the middle of nowhere, South Dakota, um, because they want to see and help something special. And uh, that, that's really enheartening. We would not be here. If it, we had so many visitors, we actually had to put an RV hookup on the place because we were like, oh, well, yep, park it back there by the tree line. Pigs are right there, though, so be careful for that. So I showed this yesterday. Why are you here? Why are you doing this stuff? And for me, you know, I ask this question to myself a lot, and I try to use this question in, in motivating my decisions on a daily basis. This planet is facing some serious challenges right now, and, and the status quo is not good enough anymore. We cannot keep burying our heads in the sand. It takes more than just a packet of wildflower seeds that you hand out there to save the bees. For Christ's sake, I'm so tired of packets of wildflower seeds. It takes somebody, there's so many pamphleteers, people handing out information but not doing anything. It's going to take bold action, people that have the bravery to stand up and change their own lives. That is the way we are going to right this ship, the only way. And so that's why I do what I do. That is why I started this thing. Um, and I would not be here without just a tremendous team of young scientists. 
one old guy there in the back, getting older by the day, um, makes getting out of work or out of bed in the morning a lot easier. And then just a ton of uh, people have come out to support us. Um, there we are, ecdysis.bio. It's a 501c3. Please, if you believe in what we're doing, research isn't cheap, and it isn't going to come from anywhere else, folks. You guys got to pony up if you want to see this stuff done. Um, Blue Dasher Farm, there's our website. We're trying to get our science on there as quickly as we can, and there's our uh, Facebook and Twitter. And I got about 10 minutes by the sounds of this. So, is there questions? Thoughts, concerns? Do you have any idea what funding sources are going to be necessary? Do I know? In my heart, yes. Do I have evidence? Somewhat. Um, it's the large corporations that are, you know, the pesticide companies. Crop life is what the beekeepers call them. Crop life. I can see a lot of this started back when USDA quit funding the land grants like they needed to be funded to get the research done and all the land grants went out to the Monsanto's of the world which is not my favorite company yep. and that's where the funding came from that's where the research went then. Yep, that's right and the the government didn't pull well they might have pulled back some funding but the universities started to use it to fund a bureaucracy rather than the the mission they lost their sense of mission and that does not mean that there is not good science that happens at the USDA. That does not mean that there is not good science that happens at the universities. But as institutions, well, man, their sense of mission is way changed. They could talk a good game. Show me, show me evidence. Show me action. I guess it seems like there's a, there's an internal struggle at the at the university level between um, scientific minded individuals wanting to do what they the research they think is right versus um, the research and and paradigms that want to be confirmed by the money behind that. Right, right. How do you how do you fund innovation of of of, research, of agriculture? Right. I mean. The stuff that comes out now and how you get money is by, is <laughs> yeah, it's like you, right now there's a 10% funding rate on most grants. I mean, so you submit 10 grants and you get one of them funded, right? And then half of that money goes to the universities because they are, well, more than half in most cases because they're, because of the bureaucracy that you're filling. So half, so it's like, my goodness, the whole funding stream so much easier just to apply to a commodity group or or have uh, have a company come by and just pay for a few tests you know and it's like boy suddenly I've got a technician that I never could have afforded anywhere else I can do this research right I can do I can use that money I can use that money to do good but what happens is then you start to question whether or not the, uh, you start to ask yourself whether or not that, that more difficult question is really worthwhile pursuing and challenging that money. Because I'm doing good with this money. Why would I throw it away just to do this other study that's really going to piss a lot of people off? I'll just do more of this good research, right? It shapes the whole dialogue. Speaking of research, what would be your top two projects that you would like to accomplish? I'd like to save the honeybees. We've got we're hot on the trail of I think what's going on there. Um, I would also so right now we've got projects where we are uh, establishing um, in different systems around the com country. We did corn, so we've got a field crop situation. We're doing rangelands actively right now, and and orchard systems in California. I think that those are three big big sort of systems that we need to demonstrate the regenerative approaches are as good if not superior to conventional approaches. Um, um, then I want to start studying how the transition process works. Um, so 
maybe in orchards and here in almonds, I think there's been a lot of interest from different almond producers in trying to understand how you get from point A to point B. Because right now we're studying established systems, right? And that's a high risk period right there. So it's pretty scary for some people. Um, but we can show them how that's being done successfully using our data. Um, Uh, with respect to almond orchards, how do how would you be able to keep track of the bees because they travel so far and we usually have so many bees congregated in one area? How do you keep track of them? Well, I mean, with a study, being able to keep track of all that. Yeah, bees are a pain in the ass to work with, and that's one of the reasons why they've been, I mean, they forage five miles from their hive, but it also makes them a great bellwether of everything that's in the environment, too. They found like 100 different pesticide chemistries within bee uh, comb. The wax aggregates a lot of the crap from the environment. So there's, uh, yeah, every beehive had at least 10 different pesticides in it, nine or 10. Um, so how do you do that? Uh, yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, we need to study the entire cycle of the hives, um, which is what I'm, I was earlier in my hotel room trying to develop. Uh, the beekeepers who, one of my beekeeper friends just lost all of his hives in Nebraska. He has uh, thousands of hives in Nebraska. They're all dead. And he's like, I think it was dicamba. So I said, well, we're the only ones that have dicamba data. Um, so if you would like us to do this, and that's the other part of this too is, I mean, so then, the, uh, so then it's like, all right, well, then we're going to, we'll establish a competitive grant, and then you, you, we want you to apply for it, John, because we want you to get the money. I'm like, guys, I don't have time for this shit. I, I mean, uh, the reporting and applying for a, a granting program that gives 10% funding rates? Give me a break. Listen, I'm, I'm functioning at 10% of what my former laboratory uh, had. We're pumping out just as much science, so we're 10 times more efficient than they are. And you want me to report once a month in order to g dangling a little carrot in front of us? If you want to see the work done, give me the damn money and then get the hell out of my way and let me do my job. Um, that doesn't make me very popular, but it, it's, <laughs> that's what needs to happen, right? That's what the land grants used to have, you know? That's what they used to have. It allowed them to be flexible and dynamic and pursue the things that needed to get done rather than I mean, uh, yeah, traditional r research venues, they've got entire grants and contracts, offices. Like, the bureaucracy is totally bent on, like, oh, okay, yep, yeah, we'll get your report in. Oh. Crazy days. <laughs> Just what you guys wanted to know right after lunch. All of this nitty-gritty of how to do science. Jonathan, love your message. The U.S. is not an island. Other regions around the world, including the EU, have banned neonicotides. What is different about the U.S. that we've been able to suppress the science while the rest of the world is paying attention? Well, I think agrochemical companies have a really strong presence in Washington here. Um, and they're working really hard over, over in Europe as well. Um, but I think that they've got a little bit m better foothold. I think that that's here. Yeah, I think they do. Do I have any documentation of that? No, this is just my my gut. So is uh, based on what what, I, what you're between yesterday and today, what you what you have been mentioning. Do you feel, and I'm thinking I know the answer, but I'm going to ask anyway. Do you feel that the university system is becoming just completely irrelevant in the in in the conversation, and private research like you're doing, open source so to speak, is going to be the the wave of change as opposed to trying to rely on a system that has been established for a long time but seems to be biased? Um, no, I think that the university is going to have a really important role in training. I mean, the, the education that students get out of universities, I think, can be very good. All right. Um, well, uh, the, the, if it forces students to think, you know, and, and challenges them to think outside of their comfort zone and how to think, then I think that that's, that's a good education right there. The risk seems to be, though, know, that that's not, a, not, that's not something that's rewarded. It's not something that's encouraged. Mm. So education is one element of this, but research is a different one, okay? And so research is more easily manipulated <coughs> in these institutions, I think, than the education. Because a lot of the professors and... and 
and the teachers at these universities really believe in science and they believe in, in what's going on here um, in terms of regenerative agriculture. I think that that's true. Um, we need to start generating the data. And I think that the science, is the actual research, needs to start coming out of something that's really mission focused, you know? And I think the federal government has a role to play here too. All of these places have a role to play. They're just, I don't know if they're leading it right now. They'll come around when it's safe. All right, keep working hard, guys. <laughs>